Welcome to Unstoppable. I'm your host, Kerwin Ray, and on this episode of Unstoppable, we sit down with Brad Seymour, who is a man who has successfully scaled and sold his businesses for in excess of $400 million. Brad Seymour is a successful entrepreneur who co-founded Wizard Home Loans with Mark Boris and went on to become one of the most recognized financial services brands and the fifth largest lender in the country. Brad is also a member of the team that launched the Yellow Brick Road Wealth Management as well as being an on-air advisor for The Apprentice Australia and Celebrity Apprentice Australia. This guy knows business and this guy knows scale and he's a sales and marketing expert. Check him out, Brad Seymour, listen up. So ladies and gentlemen, it is an absolute pleasure. The room is buzzing right now to welcome Brad Seymour. Thank you, Kerwin. Mate, thanks for coming in. Thank you for the invitation. Now, Brad, one of the things I love about you is uh, you're, a little, you're a little bit of a mysterious man. Uh, you, you play a little bit below the radar, but the depth that you come from, the experience that you have, uh, is really quite incredible. So for those people who perhaps don't know who Brad Seymour is, why don't you just give us like a real bit of a snapshot into uh, to what gets you here today? Yeah, well, thanks for, firstly, thanks for the invitation. No, it's a pleasure. And thanks for the mysterious man commentary. That gives me much more uh, cachet than I probably need to have. <laughs> um, my, my background has been through a couple of fairly successful businesses. Lucky enough to partner with a couple of fairly good quality people, Mark Burris being one of them, to start the Wizard Home Loans business in the mid-90s. That uh, gave us an opportunity to take on the big banks at that stage, uh, probably need to be taken on again given the current environment, and create the fifth largest lender in the country. Uh, we also took that business in New Zealand, made it pretty successful. We had about 260 people helping us distribute the product through branches across the country, and we ended up selling that for an excess of $400 million to GE, the biggest company in the world at that point in time. So that gave me a real background in branding, people, uh, distribution systems, uh, understanding consumers and how you can market to them in a, a way that solves their problems, which most marketing doesn't do, and uh, set me up with a, a concept of how we could do that. We did it again with the Yellow Brick Road business in the kind of uh, late noughties and early 2011, 2012. A uh, good project for us, really started that distribution model again. But um, from that point of view, the, the two big things in my career so far have been those two big distribution businesses and been really lucky to be successful. And what is it you're doing now? Um, just finished a three year stint as a director of a large insurance company. Yep. Did that to do two things. One, get uh, closer to where my family are centered in Brisbane. Great opportunity to do that. Yeah, nice. Secondly, was to get into a different industry, being in the financial services at the mortgage and advice side for a long period of time. I thought it was time to broaden the skill base. Um, it still brought into play the things I know well distribution partnerships, uh, product development, and working with people, which is what you do in every single business focus. But for me, it just gave me a chance to kind of extend myself into a different regime and different industry altogether and enjoyed that three years. It was always about a, a project. Yeah. Now focused on uh, a number of key consultancy with the key businesses in a range of industries from automotive to commercial insurance broking and looking back at the mortgage industry now and bring some of the skills I had in the past into a very changing industry right now. Yeah, right. So Wizard Home Loans, like um, that's that's a brand that probably a lot of Australians can resonate with. They're very familiar with Yellow Brick, Home, uh, Yellow Brick Road as well. But um, if you don't mind, take me back to when you guys put Wizard together. Was this, a, was this something that was done over a kitchen table? You guys saw an opportunity. How did Wizard come together? Um, so the background is uh, Mark, who was the face of Wizard, and most might remember that. Although if you're under 25, you don't. I find that <laughs> to be really interesting when I talk about uh, Wizard Homeless, people ask what that was. Yeah, right. Um, Our demo is mainly 25 to 55. Yeah, so, so you're, you're, you're safe. Unfortunately, talking to people who might know it. But it wasn't quite around a kitchen table, but Mark was one of our customers in a – professional finance organizing business where kind of finance consultants helped him with a lot of things he needed to grow. And he said, hang on, if you could do this for thousands of people, imagine the business we could create. And we said, H how would we go about that? Again, when you're starting out in the business, you're focused and you're servicing 50, hundred clients, you're thinking this is the best it can get. But we just thought about it and said, hang on, if we could amplify this, we'd find 50 people who did what we do. And then a hundred people who do what we do with assistance processes, focus on customer, um, a point of difference, and that would have been about the service because you couldn't get service in mortgages in the 90s. Uh, imagine what you could achieve. And that was how it began. What if we could go about this? Mm. The name, uh, we just wanted something that was simply memorable. And it did invoke the images of Wizard of Oz, of course, but really it was about what would be memorable and then a point of difference. We coloured it in a, a unique orange at the point in time, what no one else was doing. We, we created some smart online strategies and distribution strategies and really took advantage of pretty good market, rising tide market, floats all boats, but uh, just a different way. 
distribution, people in the suburbs, and I guess to a degree really honouring each customer in the individual sense as opposed to at that point in time the banks being very much on the nose from the customer's point of view. Yeah, right. So your experience at that point was in the home loan industry and Mark was actually someone probably sitting on the outside coming in. Yeah, yeah, he's one of our customers. Yeah, right. um, He he was a guy who had seen what was wrong with the industry because he was a customer. Um, And, you know, from that point of view... Sometimes you need someone who's outside of the industry to say, hang on, guys, you could do this. So mm. that's why I always look for people who can give you a little bit more focus on what you're doing by not being so caught in the middle of it. Yep. Uh, in the middle of something, you're in a storm, you can't often see your way through to what the other side can be. And uh, what Mark's role in that was, was all about helping us understand how we could do what we were doing for him mm. and for other customers like him in a different way for thousands. Of At scale. Years. Yeah, so... It, it, it is always good to get that person outside of your business, mentor, advisor, et cetera, to help you understand how they can apply their knowledge, your knowledge, and come out with much more than one plus one. Yeah, right. And I think it's a really important thing I often talk to people about. Get outside of your business yep. and think about it from another perspective. If you can't, find someone else who can help you do it. So Wizard, what was the what was the lifespan of Wizard before you guys sold to GE? How yeah, long? we did 10 years. 10 years? Um, so it was, we always had a strategy to build a, a very large renewing revenue stream. So yeah. mortgages are beautiful. Every day you earn some dollars from it. Great rates to the customer, but still kind of always said to my mates who took a loan out, put $1 into the piggy bank next to you and say that's Brad's retirement fund because that's how you make some money. But um, we're in a market where it looked fantastic. You were, we were funding our mortgages about the same cost as what Commonwealth Bank was. Um, you kind of then say, hang on, it can't get much better than this. We'd brought uh, the Channel 9 organisation in as investors. We'd brought ABN AMRO and Deutsche Bank, two large European, European banks in as the people that funded our mortgages. We had a great structure, great network, but we could kind of see an um, abruption coming that a challenge. Mm. And it was the GFC. We didn't think it was going to be that big. We could see that coming. So that was where in 2004, 2005, we started looking at options. And in 05, we, we ended up selling the business. So you exited at a perfect time. We were lucky. Yeah. Um, I, won't th- I won't say we're experts, but we were lucky because I often say when things look perfect, it's the best time to start saying, hang on, I've got to have a check on this. Always have an exit strategy. We always did. Uh, had a liquidity exit strategy. But for us, we wanted actually to partner with GE, not to sell. We okay. still saw the strength. But they had a global play that said, we don't partner, we only buy. So we ended up selling the business to them and we did a partnership with them, first time they'd done, into India uh, to distribute. And we ended up doing 60 or branched in the India marketplace as a wizard. Branded yeah, right. And they still are there today, believe it or not. Is that right? Yeah. India's that market that like very few people have been able to crack it yeah, in a meaningful we, way. I won't say we cracked it. Yep. 60 branches in a, a world that has 400 million middle class. Yeah out of, you know, 2 billion total population. Uh, we were getting great traction again. GFC uh, hurt your funding in those markets, but great, interesting market. More important to us, those, you know, we never really want to be out of the business. Mm. We just realised that um, it wasn't about what we wanted to do. We had to take advantage of a market opportunity. So Channel 9 is an investor. You guys got some pretty heavy hitter investors coming in to support you guys. What was it that, that enabled you to create such a strong business model so quickly that attracted the likes of Channel 9? Yeah, so um, first I might explain why we got nine. I mean, you know, one thing that I talk to people all the time about is uh, no matter what you've got now, no matter how good your idea is, you've got to find a way to get it communicated to market. Yep. And, you know, in that point in time, free-to-air TV dominated. It was well before the heavy digital age. And we needed a way to very effectively get our message out. You can't spend the kind of dollars you need to educate people mm. compared to the big players, the banks, insurers, et cetera. So nine was the partner that helped us tell our story because we thought it was a story worth telling. What it come down to, the business model was smart. We could take what we did and amplify it hundreds of times through distributors in marketplace. There was a big gap in the market. Mortgages were very expensive. The margins the banks were getting were huge. So there was enough in that to pay a distributor to be able to have your marketing and still make a great return and look after the customer with a great rate. So market opportunity, great story, good distribution model. They were the things that made sense. We still had to build great relationships with the strategic shareholders that we want to bring on board, and it took us some time. We had to have a, a defined strategy about going around. So that. you guys identified in the play that you wanted, you needed a network, like, needed a media player, yeah, needed a media player. And the reality was that um, you know the strongest media player was the Nine Network. Yeah, right. They also at that point in time had a heavy focus on diversification. They wanted to get into digital, and we wanted to bring a digital inference into. Uh, mortgages. They wanted to get out of just being a a media play um, and they got involved in a number of 
online and diverse plays and some with success and others not. So so we kind of saw an opportunity to line up what we could do, which is a great uh, distribution and concept. Uh, and what they want to do was that that was kind of create some new brands in the marketplaces and we, we were a great successful team together. Home loans is one of those industries where every man and his dog knows someone who's a, a mortgage broker, their brother-in-law, their sister-in-law. How did you in a market where many people would say it was so saturated, you know, when you talk about it from a marketing perspective, how did you create a level of differentiation that gave you the traction that got you guys where you got where you were able to? Yeah, it, it's funny. I think unfortunately we might be part of the reason why there is such a saturation. Because when you go back to the mid '90s, there really was only a an Aussie home loans model, yep. and a very, very fledgling, say Rams, who are now owned by the by Westpac and Aussie are owned by CBA. So you know there was very few in that market. So we were very early to that market. We were the first to do the physical distribution. Show. Every fish and chip shop that's shutting down the suburbs were opening up as a wizard home. So is this pre mortgage choice as well? Yeah, they, yeah. they weren't of scale. I mean, they were in the later '90s. Okay. Um, they built off the back of that market building out. Yeah, right. And what we did uh, that was a little bit different from even Mortgage Choice, we weren't just a broker. We didn't just sell other people's product. That means you're a price taker. Yep. Uh, we had our own funding, our own product. So we were price makers. Mm. So that gave you a chance when you design and develop your own products or you can control the value chain that delivers that, you got a little bit more of an opportunity to disrupt your market as opposed to, well, my message is you get exactly what you get from a bank through me. I don't know that's as differential as we can help change the way you go about getting your mortgage and the price you pay and the type of product. Again, that was a point in time in the mid-90s that allowed that to happen. Very different marketplace today. Uh, but it, it was about price making, not price taking. It was about very aggressive messaging. Uh, being prepared to be very bold yeah. um, and being prepared to challenge the market, be it the banks or other distributors, um, in a way that you know, kind of meant we're prepared to shake the market up and not be too worried about the implications of that. And when you have strong media partners and strong funding partners, you can really drop pretty hard with that. So you guys get together, you kick off Wizard Home Loans. What role was your first hire? Uh, the first hire we brought on was actually a credit person. We okay. needed someone who could actually, because we're all sales guys. Yeah, right. Um, you know, we were guys who could kind of understand how to meet with customers. We needed someone who could package it up and get the information to initially the funding source to get the transactions done. Uh, very quickly after that, we then um, brought in more the training side of the business because what we realized is that you needed to replicate what we were doing. Um, and the systems and processes that you need don't come from sales guys because we don't like to document. We like to sell and tell. <laughs> um, so bringing those kind of training and that resource in, um, it's not the sexy part of business, but, you know, if you're not prepared to put the structure to what you do, define it, refine it, define it, refine it, um, you're never going to get to replicate. So, you know, we wouldn't have the success unless we s chose to stop and invest in those systems and processes. And what were some of the biggest mistakes you made in the early days? Uh, your biggest lessons? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we made a, a massive mistake in the, f you know, we're famous for sponsoring sport, which is fantastic way. We got some really cheap assets, but the first year we sponsored the State of Origin, the Wizard Blues, as they were called. Um, you know, we put every cent we had into getting that sponsorship. We therefore had no money to do anything to leverage it. I remember they gave us 250 tickets. We didn't know 250 people <laughs> to get to the game. So yeah, right. one of those things is sticking your brand up anywhere, whether that be in any digital inference or any sponsorship or marketing, you've got to do more to get active to make people engage it. It's not just putting your presence up there. So our mis mistake in the early days was not understanding how to make what we were doing work in that that style. I remember the first time we actually stuck our brand onto Channel 9 was um, a little piece on the footy show, which was around back then. It was a $10,000 giveaway. And they didn't know who we were. They weren't well briefed. And uh, I think it was Blocker Roach at the time, who's back on air now, said something like, who is this Mike Burris anyway? Is he good for the 10000 <laughs> Mike Burris. Mike Burris, that was interesting. So, so I think from our point of view, what we learned early days was what you do must be uh, planned and defined um, many times over. Everyone on the team understand what their role is and how they're going to do it. The other thing we kind of got wrong a few times was we had ideas which we executed well on the idea sense, but then when the inquiry came in, we didn't have the arms and legs to, to manage it. We didn't have the systems to manage it. So uh, you've got to plan for success. And, you know, I mean, a, a little bit of failure isn't a bad thing, but if you have over success and you can't service it, Last thing I do is let people down, and occasionally we had five thousand calls on a Sunday, or back when calls were the way rather than you know people inquiring online and digitally engaged, um, and we just didn't have the, the arms and legs to handle it. And we were ringing people in Melbourne to see if they could help us 
deal with the demand, et cetera. So I think we learnt, um, you know, success for us was a, a bit of a road we had to travel because we got it quicker than perhaps we'd have planned. Good problem to have, but you got to very, very quickly run hard to catch up. Okay. Now you've you've had the the great experience of working in not just Wizard. You've worked in you know Yellow Brick Road and a range of other very successful businesses already. But you've also been exposed to a lot of other small businesses as well, just by virtue of you know the the associations that you've had. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see the small business markets making? that you think are fundamental that that, you know, that in many cases create the high levels of failure that we see in, in small business today? Yeah, I mean, I'm really lucky and unlucky enough to see a lot of success and failure in, in small business and all the businesses, Yellow Brick Road and Wizard, were all about small businesses mm. distributing and, uh, you know, I do a that's lot. that's essentially what they were. Yeah, they were they culminations were. and collaborations they of small businesses. 250 small businesses yeah. we got together and some were great successes and others weren't. And, they're all dealing with the same framework, all the same product, et cetera. I do a lot of work with small business these days to give back, I hope, from all the things I've learned. The, the number one thing I see with small business is their inability to understand what they're not good at. Um, and by not being able to understand and you know, agree to what they're not good at, they don't surround themselves with the right people who can supplement for that because you've got to be an expert in what you're an expert in and agree with that, but you've got to be able to admit when you're not good at something. Now, whether that be the funding side, whether that be the systems and processes or the HR management, doesn't mean you can afford to have seven people in your business, but you've got to build the key roles in your business and that means investing. Uh, it means also being really good to be self-critical. Do you think the, a big mistake that people don't make is they don't invest in their small business? Like they get to a point where they're making a little bit of money and they go, well, if I just do everything myself, then I don't have to pay anyone yeah, yeah. and that way I'm going to take a little bit more home? I, I guess the key is there that that, that risk of small-mindedness is mm. that you, you basically – taking all the risk and stress of a small business and making a wage. Mm. Well, go and work for someone if you want to do that because that's okay. Um, admit that you want success and be prepared to take the, the steps to do that. And sometimes that means actually going backwards for a period of time. So when they, everyone talks about they don't have enough capital, well, it's the mental and the, the, the economic capital you need to have and the mental strength to say, I don't know this and I need to get it or I need to invest this, whether it be leveraging my home, leveraging partners, whatever the case is, make sure you've got enough of the emotional uh, and physical capital to do it. And I, that's the thing I see time and time again. You're right. People want to just get a fair wage, work different hours to what they would working for the man mm. or the boss uh, and tell people they're self-employed. Uh, that's not enough. I mean, that's okay if you want to do that, but I don't understand the stress that people go through to get less than what would be the average wage. It doesn't make sense. Would you agree that the reason a lot of businesses don't succeed or thrive is because they don't scale? Um, firstly, is the idea they've got well defined. Yeah. So scaling something that sometimes is flawed, I've seen, and reality is that eventually something falls over. Um, so you're right. They, they need to find a way to leverage um, the capital they have, be that the idea or the access to market, um, and then make sure that what they've got, they continually reassess to make sure it's defendable because once you get scale – that can just mean cost if you haven't defended it well enough. Mm. Um, but the reality is if you're just defined by your own effort and the extent of that effort, great businesses I see still defined by how much BD work, business development work, the owner does. Uh, and the rest of the business kind of gets caught up. I, I mean, I'll give you a quick story. I was in the plane coming down this morning to see you guys and ran into a colleague, uh, not colleague, acquaintance, and he said to me, oh, you're in Sydney for the day. What are you up to? And I said, oh, got six meetings. He says, oh, I'm just coming down for one meeting for an hour. He said, can we catch up this afternoon? Now, he works for someone. And I thought to myself straight away, you've lost the proprietorial intent. You don't come to Sydney for an hour. <laughs> um, how dare mm. you do that? And the reality is that's kind of been lost because the owner of that business probably doesn't know what he's doing. So he's lost the connection with his frontline and that investment has fallen over. So I see a lot of businesses fail because they don't kind of commit. They also lose contact with what's really bloody happening in their business. And, you know, there's this concept I talk about a lot at, here and you hear a lot from me. You get what you inspect, not what you expect. You the moment, yeah, I mean, I look at people and I ask them what's happening on the calls, in their shop front, uh, at the delivery face when they install a new server with one of their customers and they go, oh, no, no, that's other people do that. Okay. And what about the customer complaints? Oh, I've got a person who handles that for me. Okay. So you handle the negotiation of big contracts and you handle the funding and yeah, and new hires. I said, but how do you know what's really happening in your business unless you are reaching in and having a look from time to time, every part of that, going on the new client visits, taking complaint calls. And people who run businesses who don't get involved in the complaints from their customers are just crazy. They're missing the one part of 
It's just, honestly the best place for development, isn't it? Oh, it's where all the it's where you pass the, the customer pain points are. Yeah. Um, you pick up a phone and say, "Hey, look, I'm a CEO of the organisation. Just want to talk to you about this complaint." They go, "Beg your pardon." <laughs> yeah. And very few people have a crack at you there. They just want to. You're showing ownership at the core, and you go, "What? What broke here?" And often it's not broken. It's mm. just the way one person takes versus another. So, getting in and, and kicking the tires and getting below the surface and having meetings, depending on how big your business is. Getting meetings, having meetings with your once removes, not just your direct reports. And the culture there, you've got to be a bit careful because people don't want to feel that you don't trust them. It's not about that. You, you trust everyone, but you trust nothing. You trust everyone to do their job, but you don't trust that processes that just happen all the time. You inspect them to sure they do because you're proud of what you do. It's your brand. It's your heart and soul. It's your customer base. And if you don't keep investing in your front line and what's happening day to day, you end up getting... Uh, further and further devoid away from what it is that makes it special. And you can also get that chance to get that proprietary intent, that founder's mentality into your teams at the front lines. You go and talk in a call center, sit there for an hour uh, and hear the way people talk and give them some feedback and let them give you feedback. You get more of that session than you will with your CFO mm. because that's what's really happening. doesn't mean you can not get yourself involved in the corporate side of your business, uh, the new negotiations, et cetera but spend the time doing things that made you successful when you were small, pre-scale. So scale shouldn't take away your requirement to be close to your business. Mm. What do you think is more important, good leadership or good management? Uh, well, they're two different, very different things. And I, I love when you ask people what they think of leadership because most people explain to you a management process. Yes. I get people to do things. Um, leadership is about giving people the room yep. to, to come to you with recommendations, the room to take ownership, uh, the, the opportunity to give people the scope to create something that you wouldn't have created on your own. Uh, management is the ability to make sure that those things happen and mm. the, the ability to track through project management and management of individuals. Now, don't get me wrong, you need, a, you need to have both. You need to actually ensure that you have a structure. In your Are you a stronger leader or a manager? Uh, if I'm under pressure, I'll become a manager. Yeah, right. Um, when I'm thinking in a, a comfortable, focused, less stressed environment, I feel I'm a good leader with people. Yeah. Uh, I'm a good manager of relationships and when they need intense relationship management or business relationship management. I think my biggest focus as I've looked at how I develop is how I become a better leader and how I ask great leaders or people that I feel are great leaders how they've been able to achieve their leadership status. And they'll all talk about that difference between managing a leadership. Mm. And, and there's a challenge there because they then go, well, this inspect versus expect sounds a bit like I'm becoming a manager. Well, no. Being a leader means you are able to see the nuance of a grain of salt as well as the warehouse um, and understand the difference between the two and the importance of it. So leaders don't over-respond, uh, don't overreact. They take the opportunity to listen to many, many voices. Um, they give people opportunities to make mistakes and they help people learn from it. Uh, they build people to a point whereby they deliver much more than they would have when they walked in your organisation. Um, managers help people get things done. Mm. That's okay. That's fantastic. But, you know, I prefer a group of leaders than just a group of managers. Inspiration. From a, leaders, from a leadership perspective, how important is it for a leader to be able to provide a level of inspiration? Because, you know, one of the buzzwords that we're seeing around town right now is culture. And, you know, it's very much driven by the Silicon Valley-esque you know, these large organizations like Google and Facebook that have these incredible businesses that, you know, encompass these incredible cultures where they've got ping pong tables and climbing walls and restaurants. But when we and get back- gyms in their offices. <laughs> but when we get back to the grassroots of culture, how dependent in your experience from what you've seen is the inspiration from leadership? How important is that when it comes to generating that vibe that people really play off that gets them to do things above and beyond what they do for just a paycheck? I think it- I do believe in the cult of personnel and the cult of leadership. There's no question whatsoever. And the inspiration that gives. But, um, you know, it's a bit like dropping that effervescence piece in, into a, you know, into a cup and you see it froth up for a while. Eventually it just dies down and it's just a bit of still water. Uh, reality is you've got to have the balance of that inspiration with the clarity of what it is that we're looking to achieve as a company mm. and what my role is in that. Um, so a bit like a sporting team, it's great to have a great inspirational captain as a leader or a coach, but that five-minute chat you get at half time doesn't get you through the next 40 minutes. It's then when I get out there, I feel inspired, but then I look to my halfback and my five out or I look to the gold shooter or the wing attack and I know what their role is and I trust them mm. and I know what they're going to do to get the ball and I know what I'm going to do when I get the ball and I don't second guess that. And the inspiration is I see them doing their job 
and I'm inspired to keep up with them. So inspiration needs to come from within the team as well as from leadership. And good leaders make sure the teams understand what they're doing, why they're doing it, listens to them on the feedback for the game plan. This just takes accountability for the for the direction. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm not sure that leadership is, you know, inspiration only from leadership is sustainable. So you've got to find a way to keep embedding that into your business. That's a good point. Like they're having the inspiration, but it's got to be balanced with direction. It's got to be balanced with an executable mission or vision of what they're trying I'm to I'm inspired. Achieve. What do I do next? Yeah, because Jim Rowan said it best. You know, you take an idiot, you motivate him, you've got to motivate an idiot. But if you take an idiot, you motivate him and you educate him, you give him direction, you give him a goal. You've you got an some... educated idiot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, there's so many ways we can go from here. Let's uh, not. We won't. But um, when we when we discuss um, people, you know, we talk about culture, we talk about leadership, people. Uh, I think some of the biggest mistakes or some of the biggest lessons I've learned in business is people-related mistakes, you know, the, the human capital, the human resources. What are some of the biggest lessons you've learned? Because I, one of the things I see in small businesses is a lot of them fail because they get to this point where they're making money, but they don't want to invest the money in talent. They don't want to invest the money in people to come and support them to provide a level of scale that almost insulates them from from some kind of failure if something were to happen to them. But I think one of the things that prevents people, if I go by my own experience and the experience of my clients, is they're afraid that they're going to make mistakes first and foremost, but they've hired someone before and they hired a dud and it never worked out. Yeah. And they go, well, everyone's going to be a dud. Yeah. yeah. So don't, don't second guess. I mean, I, you've got to give everyone an opportunity to be successful. Um, so when it comes to human capital, you got to reflect on what it is you've done to set the person up into the role, um, to help them understand what they're looking to achieve. How have you hired? Can we step back even a little bit further yeah, before you go on there? Yeah. Like, what are the biggest lessons you've learned about recruitment? Because oh, so, some so, people interview really yeah, fucking well. Let's be do. honest. I mean, and let's face it, you can you can Google um, how you can interview very very well. You can answer every question perfectly. Um, I mean, for me, unfortunately, I'm a very emotive hire. I'll look for a cultural signals. I'll look for personality traits. So I'm a strong believer in the balanced personality in a team. I'll try and assess what type of personnel they are, how they fit into what we already have, much more than just the individual. So you might have a strong individual who's you know, great at an ideas and very informal, going to be very personable. But in that team, I've got too many of those already. I'll find that that won't work. So I try to fit the individual into the team uh, rather than so obviously requisite skill set, of course, yep. tick that box. I don't interview unless that's the case. Are skills more important than attitude? Uh, no, no. Okay. The skills are a bedrock. The attitude yep. is going to get the amplification of that. And the attitude to say, how do I take what I've got and learn? Yeah. So making sure they're always looking to learn. So I'm looking for learning signals. I'm looking for signals that talk about how they want to work with a team and how they want to own something in that, but be prepared to learn through that process. So it's a real balance in that regard. Um, but depending upon the type of person for the role and the type of role, you look for where that fit in the culture and under the culture, but I'm talking about the culture of personality. So where have I got my hours, the people are your engineers who think about the idea overnight and come back in the morning and say, this will fail or work because of this. Where have I got my Labradors or the people focused who make sure that the there's a sinuous connection between all the individuals so that everyone's getting a chance to have a voice. Got your Tigers that are task-focused people to get things done, but have that balance with some ideas, people, the peacocks. And I look for that balance. So when I'm interviewing, I'm looking for personality fit, I'm looking for that fit into that team culture, the way that you share. Uh, I'm looking for the ability to have the skills, but the will to do more with it. Um, and I'm looking for people who've done some bloody research in my business, mm. people who have invested time, effort, who've got the intellect to, in that interview, admit if they don't know something. And I'll always ask a question I know they won't know the answer to, to see the integrity of that process. Because uh, that means that when I'm not in the room or their manager's not in the room or their manager's manager's not in the room, um, the integrity won't fall away. Now, you can't be certain with that process, but uh, you can start asking some good quality questions. Um, you know, there's, you know, you really need to think about the way that the the new economies, and I do mean the Googles and the, the Facebooks of the world, et cetera, have changed the way you interview. They interview with a very different style of um, the skill set is is a given before you get to the interview process, but it is the will set, the ability to think outside of the paradigm of what they think the answer is going to be. Uh, situational questions that put you somewhere you don't expect to be and look for the reaction both in the eyes and the, the tone of the voice as well as the content. Um, so, you know, from that point of view, I don't know a perfect way to interview, mm. but I certainly look for, a, you know, a connection with the individual at the level of what I expect they need to be in the team. Have you had to let a lot of people go over the years? Yeah, unfortunately you do. I mean, it's part of business. So when it comes to, you've reached a point where you've identified that someone is not doing their job at the level that's required. 
at what point do you engage, at what point do you rehabilitate and at what point do you start asking the bigger question and looking towards an exit and how do you exit if, if yeah. you reach that point? So, so for me, um, depending upon whether or not they've just simply not got the skill set that they defined, they thought they yep. told us they had, I'm looking for the attitude. If there's someone that's showing the attitude to want to improve, then you invest in them. Yep. Um, if they're not creating, um, if they're creating harmony in the balance of the team, then you invest in them. If they're giving you what you need from the, uh, the soft skills side and the, the team personnel and the culture side, then you'll invest in them. If you're seeing that corrosion or erosion in the balance of the team, that's when you've got to start to question it. And I know it sounds like, well, if the numbers are adding up, I'm looking more at what their, their harmony in the team is than mm. just simply the outputs they've got because there's a lot more damage can be done in the group of 10 than the individual. And when you say having let someone go, you have to pull back and, yes, you think about the individual invest in them, but you must think about the totality of your business and your balance of the people. Your responsibility to the 10 is greater than the one. Um, and, you know, again, you've got to be very careful in HR processes and that's a separate discussion altogether. But you also need to bring people on that journey with you around, you know, why are we getting to where we are with uh, X, Y, or Z? And how can we seek to change that? What questions have been asked by you and of them, of you by them? And make sure you've got the balance of the people in the team bought in. But you'll find teams opt in and out pretty quickly. Uh, when you see that, it is really time to act. And there, that's where we have acted on um, severing people from organisations where that cultural fit's not right where the behaviours and the mm. values are not set. And, you know, you can actually answer questions in a value sense pretty easily in an interview. You can't do that over six months in the way you act in an environment. So we look more for that alignment. And if that's failing, then that's when you've got a challenge. Hard yeah. to do in the first three or six months in the probation, yeah. but you've got to try. And when it comes to exiting people, um, like do you have a particular method that you like to use or a process that you like to use? You know, I know for me personally, like I'm, I'm really good at getting people to put their hand up and resign to empower them with the decision versus, you know, firing them yeah. so that they, you know, they perhaps take it as a, you know, a major hit to their, to, to their psychology on the way out. It, I think the key is there, um, depending on how long someone's been with you, yep. uh, it'll change the process, of course. If uh, someone's been with you for a short period of time, it's a joint outcome of, look, we, we've endeavoured this together. Mm. Uh, there's been something that hasn't fit as a group and you take joint accountability. Um, I mean, I think that's an important part because you are as accountable as the individual in that environment. I do like the, you know, giving some of the, the, the dignity of letting them understand what the repercussions of the discussion are and giving them the chance to make their own decision because it is about them taking that ownership and driving mm. it forward. Some people can't see it though. Yeah. That gets a bit tougher. But if you had someone with long tenure and it's often about the fact that they haven't changed or the business has changed significantly or something's happened in the world, that's a harder discussion. Um, and, you know, I, I can't generalise on that. It really comes down to the individual. you're paying a, yeah. a real respect to that individual. Yeah. But if you're sub 12 months, then it's, I think it's a joint accountability. And a good mm. employer will take that accountability. I, I, You know, the bigger your business, the more your HR machine comes in and runs that. I, I don't like that personally. I find it unbelievably, um, you know, invasive to the personal relationships that should be in place. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, you've got this stringent law regime that allows you to or requires you to, to be focused on that. Um, but at the same point in time, if you haven't been doing your job to give people the feedback through that process, you've got to face up to that. So what's your one-to-one -one regime? What's your operating with them with your staff? Do they know what's expected of them? And do they know if they're delivering against it? If they don't, you've got to fix that because no use letting go one individual when what it is, it's your operating system's wrong. You've not got the rigor and rhythm, the rigor, the the rigor and the rhythm of defining what people should be learning, mm. what should they be doing, what's my role, and how do I know I'm doing a good job? That often is at the heart of when people are letting people go. They're kind of saying, "I don't know what my job is here. Can you take some time to train me? Can you take some time to develop me? Can you take some time to let me understand how I can do my job, how I can do it better, and then how I can provide your feedback so we can all do it better." Um, and it's interesting, the, the, um, the, you know, the sub 25 year olds in my businesses over the, over the last three and four years have been more vocal than anyone I've got that's over 35 because they've learned a regime where you don't have to sit back and, um, you shouldn't be sitting back and being told what to do. You want to give your voice. They're in the publishing world that you can publish wherever you want. And you've got to listen to those people because they're often really considered in their views. Relationships, um, businesses are founded upon them, um, whether it be with the team whether it be with suppliers, relationships. Uh, but the one that I've always struggled to really know, I'm really good at relationships. Well, when it comes to partnerships, I've had some really tough lessons. Um, you seem to have been able to create and leverage off an enormous amount of success 
through really strong partnerships. What is when it comes to getting into partnership with someone? Like, what is it that you look for, or what do you think are perhaps the the things you need to be aware of, and the mistakes that people make when you know being either choosing a partner? And we'll get to the we'll get to the other side of the equation. Is, okay, you're in business and you've realised your partner's you know That's it's not true. working, but to get in, like, what are some of the lessons you've learned on the way in? Yeah, so so just to really be be clear on that partnership at the point of where you're working in. Um, a shared interest and in, in owning a business together, as opposed to the concept of working with business partners. Yep. The right side. Partnerships, um, and this is a question I get asked a lot because I've been in partnership for, for most of my life. Um, they work best when you've got a clarity of understanding that you have certain skills and your partner has complementary skills. You're clearly defined about what you do and what they do or what collectively you do. Um, mean, you know, you divide it up in sales and marketing and process, et cetera. And you continually reassess, are you, uh, have we got the right mix with regard to the skill sets of the partners and are we developing and are we delivering? Um, clear understanding of what the objectives are and how much I expect you to do versus what you expect me to do. And being open and having some integrity in the discussions to be able to call and say, listen, I think I'm putting in more than you at this point in time. I think I'm, I'm, I'm over-investing here or you're not investing enough. It's got to be very mature, that interface, for that to work. Otherwise, it kind of gets emotive. Um, but the reality is that the partnerships I've had have been successful because people have understood their role, because they've been well delineated. You do X, I do Y. Is together. this to the point of a shareholder's agreement where there's oh, like yeah, yeah, really clear? You, yeah, you absolutely need to have yeah. that. I mean, no use thinking about documentation on the exit. Yep. Um, you need to be clear in that, that, that up front. And I think that needs to be something you don't revisit the document every 12 months or every six months. You need, re, you need to revisit the framework of the way you're working together. And no different to a, a, a marriage. I mean, reality is a marriage is about smart compromise at all points in time. It's about being clear about what you do with the kids or what they do with the kids, what you do with managing the finances. Um, so reality is that a partnership absolutely sits just like a, a relationship, uh, a, a marriage or a long-term relationship. You're clear on who's doing what. Well, if you're actually doubling up doing the same thing or no one's doing it, you've got challenges there. If you feel you're not pulling your weight or they're not pulling their weight in the relationship, it'll manifest in negativity. Business partnership is exactly the same, just there's money involved. Mm. And that gets kind of grubby in the Australian mm. vernacular. You don't want to talk about the money. Well, you've got to solve that before you start the partnership. Be clear on when you're going to talk about honest, straightforward pieces. Have the honesty sessions, get it on the table, but realise that that's not something that means you can't be great business colleagues and friends at the same point in time. So divorcing that pragmatic business discussion, pragmatic bit of feedback about what I'm expecting from you and you're expecting from me versus you know, ducking down to have a, a lunch or going to the pub or going to the footy on the weekend or going to the kids' game, whatever it is that keeps your social engagement, they've got to be separate and you've got to be mature enough to be able to do that. Most business partnerships fail because there's not a maturity in the discussions. Mm. There's not a clarity of the intent of the way you want this to work. And when things go off the rails, you can't articulate it because it doesn't link back to something you agreed. And people go, well, I didn't know you've expected that from me. Well, reality is it's a bit like I didn't know you expect me to pick the kids up from training on the week. And well, you do because you talk about that. Same thing's got to happen in business. Why do you think so many people can't make partnerships work? Because I, 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 this is one of the biggest issues that I see um, where people will come in and they when they work with us, oftentimes they've either been in a partnership or they aren't in a partnership and it's much like a marriage. You know, they've got one going in one direction, the other one going in the other direction. How do you bring partners together in a way where they can be cohesive apart from what you've already said? Yes, yeah, so, so, I mean, I think the key is there over time people's personal situations change. Yep. You've got to be very cognizant of that. You've got to say at any point in time if things are changing, has it changed our dynamic? But I think maybe a, a bit of context they could when the people in your organisation that come here massively motivated that motivation and the kind of personal inspiration to keep endeavouring, if they're not seeing that reciprocated from their partners, I reckon that'd be their conflict point. So the reality is that if you don't have the, the momentum and the engagement of both partners operating at the same point in time and clarity of what you do, I think that mismatch of effort, uh, because the rewards should be the same in partnership, the mismatch of effort will be the, the, the big point that people trip on. You're not carrying your weight. Uh, you're not bringing your part of the bargain with regard to the business delivery or the sales function or managing the staff the way I expect, that comes down to how do you set the expectations? So I, I just bring it back to the same thing. How you set the expectations, how you're checking on it, and what rhythm have you agreed? Are you doing it weekly, monthly, quarterly? Mm. And if you're not, you're an idiot mm. because it's going to fail because your view will change, their view will change, and eventually those two things will be so bloody diverse you can't build them back. You don't go three months without having a chat with your husband, wife, or partner. Um, so why would you do that in the business sense? Because there's a lot at stake. 
I absolutely believe in the power of partnerships, but they're broken if it's not supported by the power of honesty, integrity, and process. Tell them what you're thinking, tell them why you're thinking it, tell them what you expect, and make sure you're prepared to listen at the same point in time. And partnerships can work because the power of two is a really powerful thing. Yeah, one plus one is like six. But before we talk about the dissolution of partnerships, let's talk about the front end, which is choosing the right partner, which you've already said, you know, you've, you've kind of touched on, you know, complementary skill sets. But where the, one of the biggest challenges that I've seen with people isn't around the complementary skill sets, it's conflicting of um, personalities. So do you have like a rule of thumb when it comes to choosing the right partner, when it comes to not just a complementary skill set, which, you know, seems to be something that a lot of co-founders will do or co-partners will do. Okay, I'm really good at sales and marketing. You're really good at, you know, administration process and the technical side. We make a great match. But how do you assess personality compatibility? Yeah, um, it's hard because the key is that that personality compatibility will change mm. over time as people are developed. So um, I, I'm not sure that you should always just be in partnership with your friends. I think that's a real challenge. Okay. Definitely don't agree with partnership with family. I'm real challenge that one, but that's a separate issue. Um, I, it is about, I guess, facing into the whole what-if scenarios over time. Maybe a little bit, div, you know, to to the left of the concept of personality is also how aligned are you in what you want to achieve and by when? Um, and how is that going to change with things in your own life change? So I know that's not the personality side, but reality is that you'll develop your personality based on what your objectives are. You know, you'll, you'll be more aggressive if you want to get out in three years versus getting out in 10 years or just simply building a business to build a business, which you always need an exit strategy. But, um, how well do you know the individual with regard to the way they act under stress? How well do you know their decision-making process? Are you able to point to uh, pieces of belief where you've seen their values be well defined and well executed against? Um, have you seen them work with individuals, work with people? So I guess I'm talking about some due diligence. How are you going about that due diligence to actually check what you think the partner is um, will be the case when they're under pressure and stress? How do you get in the sandpit and play with someone before actually yeah. getting into business with them? It's tough. I think um, often I see partnerships come from people doing business together. Yep. Um, so you're a supplier, they're a distributor, and yeah, you find right. that partnership. Um, I guess the key is that you should always be looking for uh, getting in the sandpit no matter what you're doing. So, you know, keeping your, your radar open for looking for opportunity means you're always in the sandpit, I guess. Once you're there, you you know, you need to have semi-formal discussion around what if we did this uh, and then be honest about what period of time should we just see if this works before we formalise it. Now, it's dangerous because you're kind of starting to do some level of business without a formality to it. That then gives you due diligence and at least the types of things you want to put into a shareholder's agreement. I'm not sure that everyone gets that opportunity to be that um, disciplined around the way yep. I go about it, but you're asking what would be the perfect scenario. Yeah, the perfect scenario. You, you'd, yeah. you'd have a chance to test and trial. You'd have a chance to check against the things you believe are true, the value system, the way they operate under stress, the skill sets they bring and the effort of or the level of effort they're prepared, the funding they'll bring, and that'll be a big part of partnerships. Are they, can they fund what they say they can fund and how sustainable is that? And how aligned are they to the strategy of we're going to build this over this period of time? The amount of companies, small and large, I see that don't write down their three and five year objectives um, and aren't aligned in that sense and then don't review them moving forward. And no wonder partnerships result. People are not clear on the expectations of what they're trying to deliver. Do you actually think one of the reasons partnerships fail is because there is a lack of planning in process? Absolutely. Um, lack of understanding about the way you do it, Yep. Uh, the importance of it, uh, and the importance of continually reviewing that over mm. time. Um, and being open around the fact that that just helps you set up when things change, customers change or product change or your expectation change, you can stick it into the melting pot and work out what the implications of it are. Uh, we need different funding. We need to reduce our cost base. We need new premises. We need to expand. Whatever the case is, if you haven't got a framework to do it, I don't know how you're going to have that discussion. Do you think there are certain personalities that just don't suit partnerships? Like a, Absolutely. People who like, they just ha struggle to be able to share decisions as an example. And struggle to let go of something when it goes wrong. <laughs> um, look, I, I think that is the case. I, I don't think that that means that people shouldn't, um, you know, kind of look to, to challenge that framework when they're potentially looking at a partnership. Yep. But if someone's not open to uh, be challenged, that's that's going to be a so point is they're not open to be challenged. If they're not prepared to seek counsel from people in a coordinated way before they make a decision, uh, that would be a, a red flag to me. Um, you know, obviously it comes down to how do you check that? Well, you can check it practically by asking discussions. You look to find out from people who've done business with the individual in the past and see if there's instances they can, you can find out and point to that show you your belief system is right. This person is a good quality decision maker. Um, they are someone who, uh, shares 
information and shares a challenge and is open to different suggestions and then is able to liberally make a decision at the same point in time and they get caught up in it. Um, I mean, that's a pretty obvious thing. If they're not prepared to work with individuals in the past, it's not going to change. Some people are just best positioned to be mm. on their own. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. It just I do think... It's about knowing yourself. Yeah. And that, but I get the power of leverage, absolutely. So well, let's say that someone's reached a point where they realise, okay, fuck, this isn't working. We need to dissolve this. What, what, what is the best way that people can dissolve yeah. a partnership without too much fallout? I guess for me, I'm, I've not been involved in too many dis- dissolutions of partnership, so I'm not an expert in that. So yeah. I won't profess I am, but... Um, you know, obviously that comes down. Which is a good sign. Yeah, You're maybe, a good partner. Maybe, maybe I'm very compromising um, or uncompromising. <laughs> something who knows. But I think the key is there that comes down to how well. Yep. I mean, if you, if it's a breakdown in the communications and the personality, that's a problem. If it's just simply you've reached a point where by hang on, what we're in this for, the collective focus and um, the skill sets we thought we had um, aren't there or it's changed, um, then it should be a very pragmatic discussion. It comes down to how good you've had that discussion through the process, though. I mean, if it comes to surprise to your partner, you don't think you should be in business, then, I mean, you're, you're the one who should be accountable to that. So you've 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 been a part of a, a major build towards a, almost a half billion dollar exit, which is no small feat. How critical or how important was planning in the process of of building Wizard and building the other businesses that you've been involved in? Yeah. So um, the the Wizard business was an interesting one. When I talk about the strategy of the Wizard business, it was pretty much strategically about building the right shareholders because that gave us the capital and access to get our message out there. And at that point in time, we're building strategically the shareholder and the structure to fund the mortgage and get the money to to get the message to market. It was really on the day-to-day tactically to playing what was in front of you, if you use a sporting analogy, and just looking for every single person. So really the strategy was find the right people to get our message to market. They're our salespeople find the right culture of people in the team to support that effort, knowing the, the stars were our guys who were out in the market, the males and females who were setting up those branches for us, who were pioneering because it hadn't been done before. There were no rule books because, you know, we weren't copying a model from anywhere. It was actually a new model we were putting in place. Being prepared to um, ask and answer every question with another question, another challenge. So the strategy was one of those things that, you know, it's used a lot now, constant optimization before we understood what that bloody was. Yeah, right. Strategically, it was about getting that shareholder base and getting, you know, the, if we knew we could fund it, we meaning fund the mortgages, we knew we'd have, the, the model was working. Every single person we put the offer in front of, whether that be the consumer buying the product or the distributors were saying, this is so new and unique, I can take it. I think it was, you know, just once, once in a life cycle opportunity where the planning of execution wasn't as important as the planning of the idea mm. and the planning of making sure you have the capital to support it. Um, in business, you know, in Yellow Brick Road, it was much more important to have the strategy mapped out with regard to the way you were going to go to certain markets, the products you were going to bring, um, the people you needed for key roles around compliance, et cetera, which was a, a much higher level of a hurdle of compliance and rigor than we needed in our mortgage business. Um, so, so for us, you know, I come back to the strategy for Wizard was pretty clear. Uh, build this thing really quickly because the bigger it gets, um, the more you'll be able to track the infrastructure you need to mm. make it bigger again. And, you know, it was self-fulfilling in that regard. So get to that next level of exposure, get to that next level of advertising reach, get to that digital engagement that gets another level of yeah, reach. Right. So it's quite, if I'm right, it's quite short-term planning you were using in the early stages. You guys didn't start with and go, okay, in 10 years' time we're going to exit. So, so it was a long-term strategic shareholder map, yep. but a very short-focused execution yeah, plan right. that said, let's keep executing on a, you know, it, you kind of, if you said it now, you describe it as an agile process where we were planning on a six-week cycle with agile boards up. Well, that's all bullshit. Yeah. We were just playing as hard as we could work, as hard as we could to get every single person into the model, find as many new customers to bring to that model, get every one of those loans approved, and then get to the next month and get to the next month again. Um, it was actually just that ability to kind of lower your eyes, look for the next 30 days and work really hard in that 30 days, knowing that strategically we were building the capital, the network to keep perpetuating that model we're building. Um, so the two things were running parallel, yep. running very hard in parallel, uh, but we weren't sitting back saying, let's plan our next three years. And, you know, we had a map of how many branches, where they needed to be, of course, 
that was the framework, though. Yeah. The execution was what it was all about. And that's, that, that's the case with many businesses. Yeah. It's oh, all about bloody execution. Businesses. No, don't get me wrong. But I'm just curious if that is more of a throw off your personality style. Like, are you someone that likes to look into the future and then, you know, plan and then execute like a mofo towards yeah. it? Or look, is it? I mean, I think the key is it was probably more of a re- reflection of the market at the time. Yeah, right. The market was so buoyant with regard to the size of the opportunity, meaning the competitors were. At a cost, I mean, mortgages were seven percent. Um, we could sell them for seven, and the market was selling at eight. So your message was that good. You could say someone thirty grand on a mortgage. That's a great message. You've got mm. to get as many people as you can. So you're running hard. There were that many people who were in banking who were looking to get out and do something different. They could become distributors for Wizard Home Loans. So you knew that that perfect market wouldn't last forever. So you were running hard, mm. and you had to build almost this. You know, you were running hard to build some scale. We talked about scale earlier in that platform of product and distribution um, that it wasn't about, well, how do we build the next 18 months? It was how do we build the next 18 days? Yeah, that was mapped to the kind of personalities we had in. Very, very, um, you know, long hours, very aggressive culture with regard to finding the right people, being very, very smart in the way we brought them on board and trained them effectively and keep them aligned. But if they stepped outside of the criteria, what we said was right for a customer, being very deliberate around that. Uh, but yeah, the, the culture is get it done fast. And if it doesn't work, dump it and do the next thing. So don't cry over the spilt milk. Yep. And did the, in terms of the time frames for planning, did that change with Yellow Brick Road? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a much more complex business. Yeah, right. Um, the reality is that, you know, it was a business that had um, expansion into accountancy, insurance, financial planning, and, mm. and mortgage, and it was a much more, so it, and it was, it was a public a company, so it was a much more complex business. And that's, you know, complexity's hard. Um, you know, I'll, I'll keep coming back to one simple thing, uh, you know, keep it simple if you can. And uh, simplicity was a key to, to Wizard. Uh, the complexity was in the shareholder base. The simplicity was find great people. They'll find great people and they'll find great people. Mm. Let's just keep firing that with good messages, constructed well with great product uh, and the marketplace will keep coming to you and that's what happens. So pretty bloody simple strategy. So if you're going to be giving planning advice to a, a small business who's listening to this, like what would be the, the, the ABCs, the one, two, threes of, okay, if you're going to plan, here are the basics. This is yeah. what you need to be doing. Yeah. So probably to contradict the, the, the message with Wizard, I don't know that there are simple markets anymore. I don't know that there's, you know, when you see a gap the size of what we had then, it would close on you within six months today. Um, you know, it, it would close, it didn't close on us for, for three, four years. By the time it was closing, you kind of had almost these barriers for entry, which were too large and people can catch up. So uh, I think it's important that people, one, uh, ensure they understand uh, what their market is. And that sounds silly, but understand what you're trying to sell and why you're selling it. Uh, what is it you're trying to solve for people? Um, so it's not just the marketing conundrum. How is your experience you'd be giving your customer meeting the challenge they've got uh, and are you able to articulate that really quickly? 30 seconds, tell me what you do, tell me why you do it and why do I want to buy it? Uh, or why does anyone want to buy it if it's not me as the individual? So make sure that's really clear uh, because then you can make sure that every single person in your business understands that and you can have a uniformity but also the amplification effect of everyone in your business talking in the same structure. Um, I do think you've got to ensure that you've got the right team. And I know, again, that's simple stuff, but it is simple. Make sure you've got the right team with the capability and capacity to deliver against your plan. And you do have to have a plan. Um, it's not like Wizard you can run every 18 days. That market has changed. And there's a speed and velocity today that's much more apparent than it was in the mid-90s. But because of that, you need to have a plan because others will be able to take parts and shares of market quicker than they were, they did in the 90s. So the model that worked back then doesn't work every single mm. time. Um, you know, I'm not an espousing the virtues of the simple model we had then. I espouse the virtues of the way we work with our teams, that people understood what they did. They knew why they did their role. They understood what their partner did and they worked in one direction because they believed in the fact that people needed a better deal. Um, and we kind of said there is a better way and it's wizard and everyone just kind of got on board with that. It was pretty simple. Best piece of advice you've ever received that you'd give someone again? Yeah, um, never bullshit a bullshitter. Um, I know that kind of needs a bit of explanation. But what that's about is um, ensure you know what you're an expert at mm. um, and no matter how much of a salesperson you believe you are, stop selling uh, and be an expert. So that means, uh, you know, surround yourself with people who know things. Admit it when you don't know, know something. Make sure you find it out. Uh, but, you know, integrity is everything. So the key is there, build in yourself the resonance that uh, when you're talking about something, you know what you're talking about. Mm. And biggest opportunity for business right now in um, general? Yeah, I mean, I, I hear a lot about customer experience. I hear a lot about 
uh, you know, people trying to, to kind of own the experience for their customer with their customers. But, you know, I just think there's a, a piece here that there's so much information in the marketplace. The people that cut through and tell it really simply at the moment are the ones who are going to succeed, no matter what market you're in. So make it really simple for me. Make it simple that I can understand it uh, and then I can work out how it's relevant to me. Um, and if I can continue to be relevant with the customer, I meaning I ask them all the time how I can continue to be relevant, ask all my, my staff how I can be relevant. I know it doesn't say a single industry or a single kind of structure, but it is about keeping it really simple because I think we're making complexity part of the norm today and that means things bloody break. People break, processes break, customer relations break. So, um, you know, make it simple and therefore you can be really accountable to what it is because you're saying you're doing X and you deliver it. So, uh, you know, I think that concept of know what you're going to do and do it well. And your thoughts on um, social media and the disruption we're seeing now? Yeah, look, I, I mean, I think it's um, – Great opportunity to be able to amplify a message, great opportunity to be able to build networks of like-minded people or challenging people. Uh, can be a massive distraction uh, because the key is there in a business in the, the 90s and the early 2000s, you know, you wouldn't listen to the one or two disparate voices. You'd take them into account, but you wouldn't make an, mm. a, a judgment that way. I see uh, CEOs of organisations looking at one media po- uh, social media post and thinking they need to take action on that. Um, and then sometimes when they see us gr- groundswell of thousands, they don't. So I don't understand how that's been calibrated. But the reality is that um, we've seen over the last three or four years, whether it be the Arab Spring, um, the ability to change massive pieces or the Me Too movement, massive pieces of indentured um, structure within our society, not just business, um, that people would thought had never changed. And it's like the war coming down when I was a kid. These things that you said, that might never happen. The, the things that you're seeing change, they come from people wanting to voice their opinion. But the challenge is that, you know, don't overreact to any single opinion because you wouldn't in your real life. Mm. Um, so one, understand it. Make sure that you have people around your business who are experts. And I do mean that, you know, be an expert yourself, but realize that running your small business, you won't be an expert in social. So find a way to get that expertise in your business. Be very cognizant of it, uh, but don't let that run the way you do what you do. Listen to your single customers. Ask them stuff, not just wait for someone to post their opinion um, because I do think that vocal platform is one that can be used to disadvantage as much as advantage. So make sure you've got kind of calibration. Brad, it has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for coming in, mate. Thanks again for the invitation. Real pleasure. Thanks, Thanks, mate. Thanks. There you have it, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Unstoppable with me, your host, Kerwin Ray. And do me a favor, don't forget to drop me a review on iTunes. We'd love to hear what you think. I love reading what you guys have to say and your reviews. Make sure we keep creating killer content just like this. If you want to stay up to date with me and all my movements, please jump onto the website, kerwinray.com. And also check us out on social media at Kerwin Ray.